you're very welcome um, and thank you for turning out on this bitterly cold night. Um, you're welcome to our final talk in our series uh, on St. Bridget. The series was organised under the auspices of the Kildare Federation of Local History Groups and supported by Kildare County Council through the Bridget 1500 initiative. Um, as I explained last month, uh, we had to swap around the last two speakers. Um, so apologies if anyone has come uh, expecting Mary McGrath. But the good news is that um, her talk was recorded. Uh, so it's now up on the Federation website, uh, if anyone wants to have a look. So that takes me to this evening's talk and this evening's speaker, uh, Liam Kenny certainly doesn't need any introduction to any of us in the local history community, uh, but for the record, Liam is Director of the Association uh, of Irish Local Government, um, founder of the NACE History Group, co-editor of the History of NACE, uh, contributor to many stop. and varied stop. journals. <laughs> okay, That's Liam, not. okay, That's Liam, I'll stop, I'll stop. <laughs> you, all, you all know Liam, anyway. So uh, Liam has been uh, doing um, a good deal of research uh, over the last 12 months or so, and he's going to talk to us tonight about St. Bridget and Europe. So over to you, Liam. A green usla is a kush broad old on Vatan Shahanot, Conan Dara Leachton Shra. Uh, Egor Intus Group of Starula Chula Conte Kildara, uh, Fuin Tedl, Nave Breeder, Mila is Kui Kade, a car os for car. Um, ladies and gentlemen, and friends and, and people who are interested in Bridget, both in our core and in our periphery, uh, you're very welcome along tonight. And I thank you all for venturing out at a time when there's all sorts of weather and yellow warnings out. Now, there's a good case I see distributed across the theatre in various ways. There's a good case for you to all kind of get a bit closer, huddle in, and allow body heat to combat uh, the freeze as it sets down over Kilcullen. Hopefully I'll, I'll manage to advance uh, uh, proceedings before rigor mortis begins to set in. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Brian for, for introducing me. As he has introduced um, the previous distinguished um, speakers, uh, it's hard to imagine that it was last year that this series actually started, um, in August, um, with the, uh, a very erudite contribution uh, from Dr. Neve Witcherly from Maynooth University, and followed um, by uh, enthusiasts and scholars and authorities on Bridget, or dimensions of Bridget, in the persons of Mr. O the, the polymath Mr. Owen Corrie, Sister Rita Minahan of Solis Breda, uh, Mario Corrigan, who very much, I suppose, carries the torch for Kildare Town and its history and connection, and Miss Mary McCarthy, who I'm very grateful for exchanging uh, sessions with me uh, last month. I'm also conscious that this um, presentation, as with the others, uh, is being filmed um, by our controller of outside broadcast, Mr. Sean Sork, up in the booth. So I want to say to those of you who may be viewing this at a different time from this night of the 8th of January 2024, or in a place near or remote to Kilcullen County Kildare, that you too are welcome. And we would look forward to you uh, putting a comment onto the YouTube facility so that we will get some impression as to where um, near or far there may be people viewing uh, this, this um, video. So in any event, uh, what I, my, if you like, slice of the very multi-layered St. Bridget story is to speak a little bit about uh, St. Bridget and some connections with the heart, if you like, of the European continent, of the European project, and devotion to her, as I say in the title, uh, on the banks of the Rhine. And I'm fortunate enough, through my, uh, uh, if you like, day job, to have the opportunity 
once or twice a year to travel to Strasbourg on the eastern margins of France uh, in the old French province of uh, Alsace and just a few kilometres west of the Rhine and looking across towards the Black Forest uh, in Germany. Uh, so that's the, the context. You'll be seeing a lot of maps um, here just to help us get a little bit of, a, I suppose, a, a fix on uh, what, I'm, what I'm speaking about. Um, and I'll begin so with um, here. I suppose um, people would be, who are in, read about Brid Bridget or interested in Bridget, would be familiar with the accounts of Bridgetine relics uh, in Lisbon, of which there are in fact two, one uh, in a church beside uh, the airport in Lisbon, uh, which Owen Corrie spoke at length in his talk, and also another in the Dominican church in, in Lisbon. Um, in Bruges, where there's a piece of fa fabric, and in Cologne, um, where there's a, a monastery and statues and so on uh, dedicated to Bridget. Um, but it was in 2018 that I more or less stumbled across uh, devotion to Bridget in Strasbourg and in its environs. And when I brought back that back and spoke to people uh, here in the, the Bridgetine movement and in the county library, they were surprised to, to learn of that presence. But in fact, it's very much there and it may indeed be the oldest in situ of the Bridgetine relics uh, on the continent of Europe. So we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail. So this is a, a, a map of the, the province of uh, Alsace that would be sort of further inland France to our left, to our right, uh, the, um, the eastern margin is um, described by the River Rhine and you're into Germany and up to the north you're uh, heading towards that triangle where France, Germany and Luxembourg meet and at its very south you're heading down towards um, Baal and, the, and a corner of Switzerland. And it's an area of low hills, the Vosges Mountains, fertile, famous for its vineyards, its white wines and so on and very much, uh, I suppose, then uh, to the east, uh, the very fertile alluvial floodplains of the Rhine and to the north of the Moselle. So that's, I suppose, the, the geography of where our little trip this evening is going to, is going to take us. So the city of, of uh, Strasbourg, um, it's, uh, you know, of, of ancient origin uh, at, I suppose, uh, uh, a crossing point on that great river, the Rhine. It has both, uh, I suppose, a crossroads of a, a, in a north-south dimension uh, in terms of, of um, travel on the river uh, and east-west then movement from the, the very ancient peoples from the, the great sort of northern German plain across to the plains of uh, Lorraine and vice versa uh, in France. Uh, in modern times, um, it's a city um, of, I suppose, just changed hands. Um, three times in the space of maybe 150 years, the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, the 1914 First World War, and uh, the Second World War, 1939-45, um, when Germany invaded and was uh, pushed back. And yet, fortunately, although there was intense fighting uh, in its environs, the city itself escaped reasonably well from the ravages of war and as a result uh, preserves a fabulously appealing uh, vista of um, buildings from medieval times uh, onto, the, onto the modern era. It's not as well known as it might be for Irish people, partly because there's no direct flights from Ireland there uh, and partly because it wasn't on the rugby circuit for the Rugby World Cup uh, fixtures in France last, last year. So it doesn't have a historic Irish footprint uh, to the extent that there's, as far as I can think of, only two Irish pubs, which is kind of very under the, under the average for a French city. And in fact, one of those was closed down on my last visit. However, uh, that has been somewhat... Um, balanced out in the modern era, uh, a number of European organisations, principally the Council of Europe, 
uh, is located there, and there are some Irish people working there. Many Irish students under Erasmus years in the universities of Strasbourg, and also the European Court of Human Rights, which occasionally uh, registers on our news. And uh, it's a very, I suppose, proud thing to be able to say that the recently appointed Chief Justice of that European Court is an Irish judge, Ms. Shifra O'Leary, who will have an influence on European jurisprudence in the human rights area for some years to come. So that's more or less the background in which I suppose I um, got to know the city. And one day, I think it was in a dusky evening in maybe late October or early November of 2018, I was walking down the street uh, back to a hotel after a, a day in the Euro bubble, so to speak, when the corner of my eye caught something, caught something which only an Irish person would instantly recognise. It looks large blown up there. It was only the size of a postage stamp on an A4 sheet of paper, a St. Bridget's Cross. And I said, what in heavens is a St. Bridget's Cross doing here on the eastern margin of France, a city with no Irish footprint, unlike other maybe parts of France, no wild geese, no Irish wine barns, no patriots or poets who fetched up there? What, what, how, how is it that there's such a distinctively Irish symbol? So I made inquiries, and my inquiries led me to the first of two men, maybe a little bit ironic, given that Bridget has been championed as a, an icon of feminism, that it's two men who are promoting her revival in these parts. Led me first of all to this man, Per Etienne Uberall, who was the parish priest of um, a parish uh, almost in the, in the city centre uh, of, of Strasbourg um, and had care of the church of St. Pierre le Vieux, old St. Peter's, in which is safeguarded this reliquary and in this reliquary is a relic of St. Bridget, uh, thought to have been brought to this region as early as the year 720. And we'll drill back a little further in time uh, later on. Uh, this here is um, his picture there. Uh, the picture, in fact, is from a, uh, an edition of the regional newspaper, Dernier Nouvelle Alsace, the latest Alsace news, uh, a paper which probably would have a profile and a circulation similar to the Cork Examiner, a daily regional newspaper, and they did an, a, an article coming up to the 1st of February about the, the relic and, and photographed uh, uh, Etienne Ubra. So, he, in, in his... Um, uh, in my very, very broken French and his somewhat better English, he related the story to me. And I thought I had first fallen across, uh, you know, a continuity. You'll know, perhaps, if you go on your holidays to the, especially to the Mediterranean and Iberian countries, the likes of Portugal and Spain and so on. And, you know, there'd be a day in June or July, there'd be a procession, there'd be colour, there'd be tambourines where they're marking a local saint's day in a continuity that's gone on for hundreds of years. I thought I had stumbled across such. Not so. What I had come across was something that speaks very much to the current experience of the Christian churches in the Western world. And what it was, was that four city centre parishes, because of declining numbers and declining vocations, uh, had embarked on the process of a forum of coherence or a forum of amalgamation. And they reached back to the ancient story of Bridget, I mean, there was that thread uh, still there, of Bridget, and the symbol of the Bridget's Cross as an acceptable symbol of their new identity. As you know, if you've been involved in committees of any kind, mergers can be sensitive subjects. And you had four parishes here, St. Pierre le Vieux, Notre Dame de Lourdes, St. Jean and St. Louis. And in the Bridget's Cross, there was an acceptable, if you like, coming together of their new identity. And they were fortunate in Etienne Uberall to have somebody who was a scholar of Celtic Christianity and who was a champion 
of St. Bridget, a knowledgeable man on the subject who's visited uh, Ireland uh, himself. And he began to do a very, um, I suppose, relevant and appropriate um, uh, things, such as um, on the Sunday before um, the, the, the 1st of February, and we're only talking about now from 217, 218, from then, he um, began to programme a special St. Bridget service on, on mass. So there, for example, is uh, a banner outside his church that I would have seen, uh, inviting people to the Feast of St. Bridget of Ireland, our patron, Sunday the 3rd of February, the celebration of the Eucharist and, and, and so on. And he would invite people with a distinguished connection or, or an Irish connection. And on this occasion, he invited Monsignor Hugh Connolly, uh, former president of St. Patrick's Seminary in Minute, who was then serving as chaplain to the Irish community in Paris. And he invited him to Strasbourg to celebrate uh, this Bridget's uh, Day Mass. On another occasion, he invited the Vatican's observer to the Council of Europe. And you will see then, intriguingly, it would include the blessing of bread and salt. Bread and salt. And I'll speak more about that in a little bit later. And of course, France being France, suivre d'un verre d'amity, followed by a glass of wine. <laughs> and it's the only place I've ever seen in a side aisle, not a parish hall or a side chapel, a side aisle, <laughs> tables being unfurled and a glass of wine being poured. I'm not sure why their congregations were falling, given that level of refreshment being available. But anyway, so here we have a, a picture I took of uh, Per Etienne, who is since retired, and Monsignor Hugh Connolly, um, who, as I say, was chaplain to the Irish uh, community in Paris for a number of years and is now back in his home diocese of Dromore as parish priest of Mayo Bridge in, in County Down. So uh, that was... There's both a city and a rural uh, uh, story uh, here. And this is, if you like, the city one. The, the blessing, uh, as I say, of bread and salt and people went up to take uh, the, the, the pans of bread and some salt and whatever. And the reliquary was brought out from its place in the sacristy for, for the occasion. And this here in the church is an icon of uh, Bridget created by, would you believe, the wife of a Romanian Orthodox minister in Strasbourg who painted this uh, icon of Bridget. But we will go back in time to explore how the, this relic uh, and how this knowledge of Bridget could have landed in a place which on the face of it was so, uh, if you like, remote from Kildare and from Ireland. Uh, I got into a bit of reading. Noel Kazan's book, which I just have to mention, uh, a lifetime's achievement, I would think, and a gazetter of almost every conceivable reference to Bridget, every holy well, church, monastery, stained glass, not just in Ireland, not just in Britain, but throughout Europe and the, and the wider world. And uh, that book had come out, I think, that Christmas. So that gave me a verification in print to what I had seen, if you like, um, on, that, on that little poster in that window. Uh, so I began to dig a little bit further into, the, into the, the books and so on. So I suppose we look at it in the context of uh, an exodus from Ireland from about the late 500s to the 700s uh, of Irish um, pilgrims and holy exiles and missionaries. Now, I, I say missionaries uh, as number three there because the impression is sometimes given that these people went out to kind of convert the heathen English and convert the heathen Europeans. Their first motivation was to emulate Christ going into the desert and taking themselves away from the familiar and the comfortable. The Irish church valued the practice of what's known as asceticism or discipline or, if you like, deprivation 
of the home comforts as part of their path towards uh, spirituality. So their first motivation is to go somewhere away from their home setting. Sometimes also they were on pilgrimages to Rome or to holy sites even then, such as St. Martin of Tours in France. But then also there may have been some missionary uh, motivation as well. Now, the outstanding one, if you like, and the people who went with him or went after him are St. Columbanus. Columbanus, his peregrination depicted by the blue arrow there, um, was uh, thought, it's thought that he was born not too far away from us here, Mount Leinster in what would be the kind of hills of modern Wexford, Carlow and so on. Uh, studied for uh, many years, firstly at a, a monastery on Loch Arden, and then at the celebrated uh, monastery of Bangor in modern-day County Down. And then quite late in his life, what we call a kind of a late vocation, uh, headed off to Europe. Now, there's some, some debate as to whether he travelled through uh, modern-day England or Cornwall, but it's certainly thought that he arrived on the coast of France around St. Malo and um, headed uh, across uh, the country towards its eastern uh, regions and established uh, a number of, um, if you like, foundations and principally at a place called Luxile, which is in the south of the Vosges Mountains. It's a little bit to the Vosges Mountains what Glendalough would be to the Wicklow Mountains minus the Round Tower. And that became a centre, if you like, of um, monasticism, of spirituality and uh, one that grew other foundations uh, in the area. Now, Columbanus, unlike many of the other uh, early Irish saints, is reasonably well documented, not least because the first vita or biography of them began to be written as soon as three years after his passing. And he was also a prolific correspondent himself. And he engaged one of the big disputes, it's hard for us to get our head around it now, one of the big disputes was with the Roman Church about the calculation of the date of Easter, uh, for example. And he corresponded with Rome on matters such as that and, uh, and, 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 and so on. However, he did have a habit of falling out uh, with people as well. And he fell out with a local king who had a bit of an eye for the ladies, who didn't go down with Columbanus' uh, strict view of, um, of uh, a righteous life. And um, this particular king's mother-in-law um, sort of uh, put out uh, 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 a warning on Columbanus to kind of get out of the area, and uh, which he did. And he is said to have attempted to have sailed out from Nantes to uh, sail back to Ireland, but a storm blew up and he was blown back to France. But I kind of think he wanted to stay in France anyway. So he came back and um, made his way, but continued on. He more or less dropped off one of his major disciples, St. Gaul, Saint Gaul um, on the border of France, or what's now modern-day Switzerland. And St. Gaul, of course, in his own right, founded a great uh, monastery which exists to the present day, and Columbanus travelled on to, uh, to Bobbio um, in, in Italy, uh, where, where he died, and, 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 and what have you. But scholars of, our, of early Christianity, and one who did most of his great work indeed in our own county, uh, the late Cardinal Tommaso Fee, for example, was um, a huge exponent of the Columban um, achievement in, in, in Europe and, and so on. And uh, many, you know, has studied him and others how many or more secondary foundations took place on eastern France, w western Germany and, and so on as a result of Columbus's efforts. But it, at the same time, sometimes people can go a little bit too far and you get books like, you know, When the Irish Save Civilization and things like that. Yes, the Irish went out. Yes, the Irish Chris, um, Christian pilgrims and missionaries brought a distinctive contribution. But to some extent, they took on some of the customs and practices that were out there as well. And eventually, um, the rules of the, the great monasteries, such as the, 
uh, you know, since the Cistercians and so on took over the Columban, if you like, uh, um, uh, rules and so on, uh, when it came to the evolution of Christianity uh, in medieval Europe. I, I'm kind of not surprised uh, in, in a way because um, the Columban uh, rule was demanded a lot of its followers. Uh, among an extract from the the penitential from the rule book of Columbus for his monks was those who become intoxicated with wine or beer shall, if they have pronounced sacred vows, expiate their offence for 40 days on bread and water. Or lay folk must do penance for seven days. Anyone who is incapable of chanting the Psalms owing to the thickness of his speech must undergo a special fast. So any monk who turned up for matins and had a few glasses the night before. For the man who steals food, 40 days penance. If he repeats the offence, three periods of 40, um, of 40 days penance. Now, those of you who know continental people, the French and indeed the Germans, they like their drink and they like their food. So I don't think the Columban rule was going to last too long. And it didn't. Uh, but in any event, it did leave its mark in its time. And all of this is the context on which the Brigidine relic. Another map showing uh, the spots over. And when I, it's very key to us for us to remember as well. When we use terms like France, when we do Germany, Belgium, even in Britain, you know, these are very modern, they're very recent terms in this scheme of, of things. Borders were much more fluid and much more diffuse uh, back in those t times. And it's really only in the modern era that we've put those framework of borders and, and nationalism. Columban. But certainly his legacy, if it didn't appeal to the dietary preferences uh, of the locals, his legacy in terms of a vision for a European continent, if you like, echoed in very, I suppose, um, influential corridors um, a millennium and more after his passing. One of the great founding fathers of the whole European project as we know it today, in terms of the European Union and so on, Robert Schumann, um, uh, had this to say about uh, Columban and his, um, and his writings uh, when he spoke about you know, totos, totos Europea, all the people of Europe, all the peoples of, of Europe. And in an exhibition mounted by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs in some of the European uh, institutions, um, they portrayed it like this, and again quoting Schumann. And indeed in 1950 in the aforementioned Luxile, there was a great gathering to celebrate an anniversary of uh, Columbus. Uh, Columbanus, and it was uh, attended by Eamon de Valera, uh, by Sean McBride, who uh, was then Minister for Foreign Affairs in the first inter-party government, and had a key role in subscribing Ireland to the embryonic Council of Europe. Ireland, which had come out of the Second World War as a very austere, a very insular state, and yet was only 10 founding members of that Council of Europe. Sean McBride was the right man in the right place, being a native born and French speaker himself. So just to have a, a little look at, at just a, hand, a, a sample of that wave of pilgrims and missionaries and people uh, from Ireland who found themselves, uh, who travelled to the European continent, and maybe to give us a little impression of how the Bridget uh, relic and knowledge found its way there. And a number of the saints in Ronan uh, in Brittany, and you kind of say, well, not so surprised we think of Brittany as a kind of a Celtic uh, state, but it's also worth uh, thinking, when we, we think about it, uh, ma you know, there were Scotland and Wales and even parts of modern day England were sources of um, pilgrims to the continent. Uh, many of the, the uh, Breton local saints are, were, in fact, of Welsh origin. Uh, Saint Trezan, uh, who um, ended up in Champagne. Uh, I, when I go to France, I take a train which is two stops, Champagne and Lorraine. And it sounds better 
in Port Leisha and Port Arlington when you're looking at a train timetable. Uh, for, Forza, or Forza, was a Galwegian who, again, a bit like um, Columbanus, was kind of a late vocation to the continent, uh, spent a lot of time in, in, uh, in Ireland to did his own monastery there close to modern-day Hedford, and uh, travelled to, uh, to a location just, just a few, a little bit to the uh, east of, of Paris and established a foundation. St. Fiacre uh, ended up in the, uh, the um, county of Brie, uh, again, just a bit to the east of Paris. Brie, of course, the name we associate with cheese, but also kind of an amusing little story why I have the arrows there. Um, Fiacre, there was a hotel um, opened in Paris in later centuries called the Hotel Saint Fiacre, and one of the services they offered to their patrons were horse drawn carriages. And that began to take on as the name for hackney cabs. So if you were going out in the street, you, you said, I'm going to hail a Fiacre. And to this day, Fiacre is the patron of taxi drivers in France. There's a, a lady hailing our Fiacre on the Champs Elysees. St. Gall, who was, as I say, part of uh, Columbus's own inner circle and established uh, St. Gallen, uh, the, the monastery of St. Gallen in modern-day Switzerland. And the three more, then, I have in black print, who could well be, um, how would I put it, um, among the suspects for the translation, if you like, of Bridget um, to this location, St. Arbogast, not much is known about him other than uh, he is described as this general title, Scotty. Now, Scotty, uh, you know, people say, look at it first and say, oh, that means Scottish, but it includes Ireland, but it also includes Wales and parts of England as well. Um, of, of that, uh, if you like, uh, cohort of uh, holy people who came from what we loosely call uh, a Celtic uh, uh, background. But he certainly established very early on uh, a church in Strasbourg. Erhard now is an interesting character. Uh, he is on the Episcopal list of succession of bishops of Arda in modern day Longford. But he's also recorded then as a peripatetic or a travelling bishop uh, on both sides of the Rhine in Alsace and in Bavaria. He ended up in modern day Regensburg in, in Germany. And he it was responsible for a number of foundations in Alsace, and he too could have been someone who brought the knowledge of Bridget. And of course, there's the connection with St. Mel of Longford and Bridget. And then the first, if you like, abbot of the monastery of Onno, this island on the Rhine, where the relic originally landed, and which were kind of moving backwards in history too, if you like, was a St. Duban or a Tuban, a D or, D or a T, uh, of Irish origin, but little else is known uh, about him. And he, the first of a number of um, Irish abbots of this monastery of um, Onu on the, uh, in the Rhine. So wh when I began inquiring and I'd met Father Uberall and so on, people then said to me, there's another man you have to see. And it's the man at the centre of this photograph here, a man called Gabriel Muller. And Gabriel Muller um, uh, lives in a, a little village just to the north of the city of Strasbourg, uh, a former mayor of that small town. And um, another champion of Celtic Christianity, a member of the Friends of St. Columban, um, who, because of the presence of, of the Luxile, uh, about 30 kilometres to the south and so on are active uh, out there and are very knowledgeable about St Bridget to the extent when I first met him he's almost no English and I communicated to him thinking I was you know great to be able to say oh I come from Kildare near St Bridget's he said to me back in French he said I've been to St Bridget's well seven or eight times <laughs> to which I said well, that's more than a lot of locals have been to it and um that's a picture the last Sunday in October of this year. He and some of his friends, that's his wife, Maureen, to the left, uh, loaded me up between two cars and took me on a little itinerary around little churches, uh, especially on the German side of the Rhine, with images and effigies uh, of St. Bridget. 
we st- start, I suppose, first, I'm going back just a couple of years, back to 218, 219, when I went to, out to meet him first. Um, this was his town, town called Kilstead. The kill there being the same kill as in Ir- Irish, kill, Kildare, Kilkenny, or wherever, the same linguistic route, even though it's over there in, on the banks on the western uh, shore of the, the Rhine. And almost, if you like, in parallel with Father Etienne Uberall's revival of the culture of St. Bridget, they too were ongoing a similar process. If you look at the three oval uh, rings there, three um, villages, each of them a parish in their own right, and each of them, again, because of declining numbers, because of declining vocations, forming an amalgamation. And as a symbol, okay, it's three rather than four, but nonetheless, they reach back to the um, awareness of the foundation, this little place called Ono, which back in that time was an island in the Rhine. Now, the Rhine has been heavily canalised and channelled and diverted in the centuries since. But they reach back to that, to the story of Bridget, as, if you like, an acceptable symbol of their union or amalgamation, reflecting, as I say, a process that's going on in the Christian churches in the, in the Western world. And it's not confined to the Catholic Church. I, I, I note that uh, in the last six weeks, in the, uh, relatively locally in the Church of Ireland, Diocese of Mead and Kildare, two churches have closed, churches that probably accommodated worship for generations of families and have, have closed. But uh, in any event, so they in turn formed, uh, and one of their first actions in 216, 217 was to commission a distinguished sculptor in their locality uh, to sculpt a statue uh, of, uh, of, of Bridget. And I kind of pushed open the door of a very uh, empty, empty church building and saw, saw this statue. And uh, beside it, uh, or near it, was um, a placard written by Gabriel Muller, and this was before I, I had met him. And just what he says there on, on the right, it's, it's in French, but like what he says is that our community of parishes, which has the name now of the Terrain of Ono, bringing back that old, old name of that first monastery, is um, a recollection of the Irish monks of the Abbey of Ono who re-Christianised our region in the time of the Merovingian kings. And he says, Il d'avion homme d'un l'air bagage un relique de Saint Bridget. Translated literally, they brought with them in their baggage a relic of Saint Bridget of Kildare. And he goes on to, to, to talk about how in another part um, of uh, the region, Bagno, there is a statue of the saint deposited each uh, year on the 1st of February uh, with a farmer who mines it for the year. And on that day, uh, the women <coughs> of, the, of the parish don't don't do any work at all on the farm. And may they, f- they get together uh, and basically party for the rest of the day. Very similar to what people talk about Ihan Oleg just gone past. So he, I suppose, was taking some inspiration from that in the, um, in the uh, commissioning of this statue of Bridget, which uh, in the years from 217, 218, 219, they process around between these three parishes. Now, they're kind of, it's all very flat land and they're close enough to be able to see the, the steeples of each, uh, but they do that and it gets um, sometimes a little bit of coverage in the local paper and, and that sort of thing. And they finish up then uh, in the, the parish hall of whichever of the three parishes will be hosting the statue for the year with, uh, with a celebration. So this was the, the, the mass which I attended in, it was uh, Kilstedt's turn, that possibly the first year or first or second year, that, that was the mass I attended uh, with the, um, the priest and also the Lutheran minister present. 
and uh, that was the um, there the the town crier, I suppose, uh, with the statue of Bridget. And I, I asked, um, you know, if you it's a different kind of statue, uh, Bridget with her eyes closed, seated, uh, and so on. And I, I asked about about that, and they they, they wanted to show, I suppose, a, a prayerful. Um, um, uh, mood, uh, hence she has her eyes closed in, in reflection. And also the cross, it's a t- what we call a Tau cross, if you like, uh, which was pointed out to me is older than the crozier, which is a, I mean, a medieval, uh, I suppose, uh, adornment. And again, you will see uh, in the front here uh, the bread and the salt. And I was intrigued by this because while we're familiar with, I suppose, the breaking of bread, in our church liturgies, you know, why why the salt is part of their tradition. So they had a little booklet, a little mass booklet, which talks about the salt, the salt, and it says, salt is an essential ingredient in human nutrition. It gives us the uh, appetite. There is the phrase, the salt of the earth. Uh, at baptism, apparently there, one places some grains of salt on the hands of those to be baptised as a symbol of wisdom. And it is a source of, as he says, appetite and minerals and so on. Its presence in a blessed forum provides us with a reinforcement of the spirit. And the salt is also blessed on the Feast of the Holy Trinity. So I just thought that was an interesting cultural uh, element in in their liturgy. And of course, um, they they had a, a little celebration and so on. And being Alsace uh, folk and being French and being, um, you know, innate boulangerie, baker, they attempted to bake bread in the shape of St. Bridget's Cross. And the effort that was made on a fairly bleak Sunday in February, people turned, you know, it was almost like St. Patrick's Day here. They turned out wearing kind of green scarves and things like that. I, you know, I was really astounded at the sort of consciousness of Ireland in a very small, sleepy sort of um, country country place. So back to, to maps again. So I come back up to the, the most recent uh, itinerary with my Alsatian acquaintances and um, we go um, visit a few, uh, some small churches uh, on the banks of the Rhine. Now I'm conscious that in the um, last year, uh, in the Fela Breda, you had a marvellous p- presentation by a lady called Barbara Brush, who uh, explored uh, greatly in this terrain and further down into Germany and down across the Black Forest and had many depictions of um, uh, statues of, of and images of Bridget in, in churches. Uh, I have a smaller number and uh, I'll just give my take on, on those, what I saw. Um, we start first, we're just on the French bank of the Rhine, as it happens, uh, in a, a little place called Offendorf. Uh, it's um, a Lutheran church, but you'll notice the Celtic cross on its uh, belfry and beside it the nameplate then for the um, Rue saint Brigitte, uh, in, in in the town. So a reflection on the awareness from this old monastery of honour. Um, we cross the Rhine now into Germany and a town called Sosbach, and um, into one of the German, uh, into a German church there. And uh, Maureen there is pointing to uh, the St. Bridget's Cross, which is a feature of the Ambo uh, in this church. And also there, uh, a, a depiction, I suppose you wouldn't call it a mural because it's somewhat three-dimensional and so on, but of Bridget. And you'll notice her, um, I suppose, in a healing mode there the broken hand that's been offered to her and she's there in a healing a healing context now here then is all that's left if you like uh, of um, a religious trace on or close to the site uh, because as I say the landscape has been changed and land has been reclaimed from the river and whatever so this is just a, a fairly modern church uh, uh, in the village of Ono, H-O-N-A-U, where the original uh, foundation was located. But the placard there, which I photographed in the church, and I have to thank my uncle Sean for the, the little bit of German translation, uh, uh, that tells us uh, that this church is on the site 
of uh, a monastery founded about 722 by the Scottish Monchon, by the Scottish stroke Irish monks, about 722. We now come to another another church again on the German side, Niederschkapheim. And firstly, this is, if there was one, if there was somebody going over there and there was one church to send them to, this is, this is where I'd send them to. Firstly, on the exterior, you meet Bridget on its gable. And with her full-on medieval crozier, but with a shamrock in its curl. And below it, the, the legend in German, Heilige Bridget, bitte for uns, which I'm sure many of you will read as, um, Hail Bridget, intercede for us. Two depictions within the church, I suppose, a fairly standard statue, but I was really taken by the blue of that banner. That lovely banner on the right. But it gets better, even in the same church. Firstly, the churches on the German side were um, unexpectedly lovely to me. Very Baroque, full of, um, I suppose, extravagant, gilded decor. On the French side, the interiors tend to be more austere, gothic, but better stained glass. And we'll see some of that a little bit later. So if we look, uh, I suppose there's a view of the, of the, the altar and the, the, the tableau, the painting, uh, at its rear. This then is the enlargement. And look at how Bridget is positioned in this tableau. There's Bridget. There's Blessed Virgin, there's Christ the Son, and there's God the Father. Bridget positioned within the firmament of the heavenly host. And it doesn't get a more, I suppose, elevated regard than that. So that's, that was impressive. We go back into the city then, the great cathedral of Strasbourg. One of the one of those awesome medieval cathedrals, you get them in England, the likes of York, Minster and Ely and Lincoln and so on, and you get them um, on, the, on the continent. An extraordinary, decorated um, every square metre of its facade uh, and so on, um, with, with every conceivable architectural endowment and effigies of, um, you know, saints and fathers of the church and angels and, 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 and what have you. And um, inside, uh, you know, the, the scale of it inside, you could truly play a football match inside it. And no matter how high you kick the ball, it still wouldn't hit the ceiling. A couple of pillars may be in the way, but other than that, how they even worked out from an engineering point of view the mechanics of such uh, gigantic structures I know not but it's a cathedral which attracts huge numbers of visitors as I say um, relatively few English speaking and even fewer Irish but so many um, certainly during the summer the, the shuffle of feet is such that every now and again you know, a sacristan or over a tannoy or whatever. So, so you'd see lance, see lance, such as the shuffle of feet and of, and of chatter. But if it's spectacular on its exterior, and it is because there's all sorts of performing clocks and bells and things like that, in its interior, its grandeur comes in its stained glass. Stained glass which adorns very, very high up the walls of, of its uh, chancel and of its nave and, and so on. And again, I'm in, indebted to um, Gabriel Muller. I, I wouldn't have spotted these, but he, such as his commitment to studying the presence of Bridget in the locality, uh, that he pointed out to me um, the, um, the presence of, of Bridget high in the in the, in the ch uh, stained glass, high on the the chancel, uh, the chancel walls, and um, it's 
it's hard to know what the artisans, these are so high, you would almost need some kind of opera glasses or, or um, small binoculars to see them, such as the, the extent of, the, of, of the, the scale of the interior of this cathedral. And Bridget is depicted twice um, in the stained glass gallery in the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Strasbourg. So just to, to, to read a little bit from a note that Gabriel Muller uh, sent to me, um, she is uh, depicted in the, the high southern um, uh, array of stained glass, um, which dates from 1240 to 1245. And there is assembly of 12 female saints which evoke paradise. First of all, the Virgin with child, and then Saints Catherine, Cecile, Odile, Marguerite, Aurelie, Agnès, Atalia, Roswinda, Lucy, Brigitte, at Barb. She's represented with a halo type effect, one of the few representations of Bridget I've seen with a halo. And she holds, wreath isn't the word, but of fruits from the heavenly garden. Then the other um, assembly uh, of eight saints, Julienne, Genevieve, Petronelle, Eugène, Brigitte, Euphémie, Scholastic and Sotera. And Bridget is again represented with decor and so on, um, appropriate to uh, an, early, an early Christian saint. But the point he's making isn't so much um, what, how she, you know, what she's wearing or how she's depicted. He's saying that she's up there with the royalty of French and Alsatian devotional culture. Saint Odile, for example, is the patroness of Alsace. He says names such as Catherine, Barbara and Marguerite are very common uh, in, in this area. Names like Atala as Eugenie are nieces of Saint uh, Odile, some of the other names that are up there. So for Bridget of Kildare, Bridget of Ireland, who never set foot in that area in a corporal way to be depicted, speaks to the devotion that there was to her in that part of Europe in the very early times. So that completes my itinerary to, to a degree. However, no um, essay is complete without its postscripts. So... Uh, as when I checked at the start of the talk, the Met Airden stations closest to us at Oak Park and at Casement were recording four and three degrees respectively, possibly gone to minus four and my, minus three by now. But in any event, I just want to show you very quickly, it's a little step back, very close to home, possibly the most recent uh, representation uh, of uh, Bridget um, is that the seminarians in St. Patrick's Seminary in Maynooth College uh, last summer commissioned uh, two icons, one of St. Patrick and one of St. Bridget, which were installed in the seminary uh, at the end of autumn last. And uh, in, in researching all this, I learned, of course, that the, you don't paint an icon, you write an icon, apparently. Thank you. And the icons were written by uh, the sisters, um, the Redemptoristine sisters in Drumcondra, who I think have another Bridgetine connection. Am I right in saying they have a piece of fabric or a relic, a relic of St. Bridget in their own right? So it was the sisters there who created those uh, icons of Patrick and Bridget, uh, which I'm sure there will be many more representations of Bridget will emerge in a few weeks' time in the context of art uh, around the Fela Breda Festival uh, but, uh, and the Bridget uh, 1500 uh, programme. Uh, but these are the most recent uh, uh, to date that I thought I'd just show you, they being in our own county. And then staying within our own county, my, my, uh, my title of this postcraft said St. Bridget meets Coco Chanel, which may have puzzled some of you. But before we meet Coco Chanel, we have to meet another woman. A woman, I think, whose output and whose repute has been understated, despite the fact that she'd lived most of her life in the heart of this county, and indeed her, her husband as well. Um, Alice Cortain, 
Her married name was Rin, she, the wife of Stephen Rin, mother of Dr. Andrew Rin, and the sculptress Breed near Rin, and others. Born in Tralee, and um, from uh, as a relatively young woman, and right through her life, as you can see, over a span of almost 50 years, had a prolific output. That's only some of her published books. Biographies of Irish spiritual figures and Irish patriotic figures. Probably one of the first to, um, if you like, uh, highlight the work of Francis Ledwich, the poet, who has become quite uh, well known in recent uh, uh, years and so on for his uh, poetry on the fringes of the, the First World War. And unusually enough for a woman of her time, she published right through her life by her maiden name. Herself and her husband, uh, Stephen Wren, who is worth another, another session in his own right, who is, I suppose, an evangelist for community development, rural development, travelled Ireland, proclaiming the winter Natira message, one of the early contributors to Sunday Miscellany, and so on. Both of them were uh, operated, I suppose, very much within a Catholic framework. But as one commentator, uh, they were unusual in that for the time they were liberal Catholics rather than devotional Catholics. Uh, I mentioned Stephen Wray in, in, in passing. He had a, a Bridgetown, I suppose, connection in that he has uh, something I want to find out more about. But he, I do know he was involved with the commissioning of a St. Bridget's Cross from Jordan's Jewellers in Nace. Some of you might remember Jordan's Jewellers there uh, um, near where the, the Ivy, Hot, Ivy Hotel is now, uh, which was presented to Pope John Paul II on his visit to Ireland in 1979. But back to our main subject, um, Alice, uh, Alice Curtain, and her book, St. Bridget of Ireland. And I was fortunate enough, uh, if you stop off at enough um, second-hand bookshops in your travels around Ireland, eventually you come across, to find a copy of her book. Uh, published by Brown and Nolan, uh, first printed in October 1933 and such a bestseller that it was reprinted in 1934. Now, the content of the book uh, probably, uh, you know, um, it follows along the fairly conventional lines about uh, what we know about St. Bridget. But kind of what fascinated me, apart from the, the content, was, of course, every book has to have a cover, and sells by a cover, uh, often. And I looked... Uh, further at this cover and um, it was intrigued by it and down at the bottom right hand corner the name of the graphic artist who would have designed this which our typographical friends would tell us was probably etched onto a copper plate for printing was an A. Inglis now I don't know whether A. Inglis was a man or a woman was Irish or English but was commissioned by Brown and Nolan to paint this cover, or to design this cover. And I suppose it got me thinking how, you know we have representations of people in the past and of saints, and we've seen some of them already. And Bridget, for example, is often portrayed in robes and a crozier. And some people will criticise that. Well, you know, that's really the, ro the robes of a medieval um, you know, bishop. It's many hundreds of years after Bridget's time. And looking on this cover, it got me thinking how every generation portrays something in the past with its own romanticism of the past or from its present day lens. And this is where it occurred to me, bear in mind this would have been designed late 20s, 1930s. St. Bridget meets Coco Chanel. Anyone see a resemblance? And tell me, those of you who'd know more than I would, are those the nails of somebody who herded sheep and drew water and cut wood? I don't think so. So, uh, so no, I, I think, uh, I, I think it's a, a very, um, a very, what's the word, reassuring uh, 
note that um, every generation looks at things through its own, through its own lens. Mm -hmm. So uh, my um, finale then is where I started, I suppose, about um, about St. Bridget in Europe. And this is the European flag that we're so familiar with. It's on our registration plates. Uh, it's probably on our passports. It's um, up beside signs. Don't see so many of them now, but when there was big road projects and that, we saw it. Flag that we associate with the European organisations. Um, how many stars are on it? Twelve. Twelve. Anybody know why there are twelve? Yeah, I, I hear twelve apostles. I hadn't thought of that one. Uh, um, the twelve founding states is is. I can see where that comes from. It's not a bad, but no, that flag originated in the early 1950s from the Council of Europe, uh, was later taken up by the European Union, uh, which was established by, in 1949 uh, uh, by 10 member states, including, as I mentioned already, Ireland, uh, was then represented by Sean McBride. So it, wa it wasn't to do with the number of founding members. The origins of that flag is uh, subject to some con academic controversy. Um, in the early 1950s, 50, 51, 52, this embryonic new European body uh, said, we need to have a flag, but what are we going to have that, you know, won't upset somebody? And there was a variety of designs of all kinds put forward. Now, this is all tabulated on the internet and, and other places. And one of the um, those sending in designs was a, a junior official, a local man who had some training in, in draftsmanship, because Arsene Heinz, Heitz. And he sent in various designs with various numbers of stars and what have you. And some were rejected and others, and, oh, and their designs with crosses on them. Oh, no, we can't have that because the Turks might be upset and we can't have this, we can't have that. And eventually, uh, anyway, the design of 12 stars was accepted. Now, if you look up a website about the European Union, you'll see some kind of, you know, phraseology on the lines that 12 represents completion and balance and whatever else. A absolutely vacuous um, uh, explanation. But late in life, um, Arsene Ehines said that he was inspired in the end by a representation of the Virgin in Strasbourg Cathedral. With its 12 stars, very familiar to anybody. The mirac Miraculous Medal, the Rue de Bac, all that, the 12 stars. And even more so down here, the globe with that blue colour and the stars. Now, nobody will say that in as many words in modern Europe. And I'm not even saying that this is the explanation. Maybe it was just a random bureaucratic outcome. Uh, on the basis that many things in big organisations are done on the basis that the solution that upsets the least people. Uh, mm. But I was just thinking, if we did want to marry our awareness of Bridget and the European um, vision, that mightn't be a bad approach to take. <laughs> so, uh, our finale, I want to thank the various people, not least, uh, and I say Mary McCarthy, who spoke last month, and um, I wish my talk uh, incorporated some, you know, innovative physical exercises that would have got you, you know, um, up kind of clapping or whatever and warming yourselves up. Uh, but um, hopefully anyway, uh, today uh, on, the, on the calendar, on the chur church calendar, it's de denoted as the first day in ordinary time. And after the festivity and the colour and euphoria of Christmas and the Epiphany, it's a bit of a downer. But hopefully, uh, as our distinguished colleagues in the Defence Forces t would say, tonight was a little bit less ordinary. And I want to thank you for your patience.
Thank you so much, Liam, for, for uh, that wonderful presentation. I think a, a, a tour de force, uh, to employ the French uh, idiom, comes to mind. Um, and can I say, I remember uh, back in 2018 or whatever it was, when Liam returned from Strasbourg, uh, how excited he was about finding this, uh, this link with St. Bridget. And um, I have watched over the years since then, being interrupted, of course, unfortunately, by COVID, but how Liam has pursued that angle. Uh, and I mean literally pursued, not just through books, but by getting out there and visiting the places. So what you're getting tonight really is the, the fruits of probably about five years' work at this stage. So thanks once again for that. Really.